Morris had marked Sunday mornings for the zoo. Bright and early, he woke Rachel and Jacob. Usually he climbed into their beds and tickled them. They would hurry up and get dressed, and then he would head down with them to the compound. Morris honked loudly and recurrently, so all the children in range would know they were welcome to join them for this weekly jaunt. From the building and the quarters they eagerly came, so many as could squeeze into the car, sitting one atop the other till there was no space left. Sometimes more than fifteen children, pinching, laughing and squabbling with one another, drove all the way to Alipur, waving and hooting at the passing onlookers. At such times, Morris, the leader of the pack, was jubilant. At the zoo, he bought them bilious pink candy floss. They dug into the puffy, gooey mess, grabbing strands from each other to shove greedily into their mouths. Then he bought many, many paper bags of peanuts and chana for each child to have their own packets to feed the monkeys. He encouraged them to run wild, so they chased each other and ran from cage to cage with abandon. He made sure to visit their favorite haunts, the cages that housed the very large rhesus monkeys that looked as though they had tomatoes stuck on their bottoms, the enclosure where they could ride Rani the elephant, and the moat where the large, lazy hippopotami barely stirred in the brackish waters. Morris held a few water balloons close to his bottom and pranced around to mimic the tomato bum monkeys, and imitated the elephant cleaning its big behind against a sturdy tree trunk. The children rolled with laughter and egged him on to do it again and again. Morris would oblige as a crowd would gather to watch his antics. These rowdy escapades to the zoo reminded Morris of his childhood visits to Ezra House. The Ezras had a miniature zoo in their garden home on Kid Street. Morris rode the large hundred-year-old tortoise that lived on the patio. Lady Estra taught him to balance himself on its back and to rub his toe on a particular spot on its patterned shell for the ancient reptilian creature to move forward. There were deer, peacocks and a bird of paradise that had come all the way from Macau. The dazzling bird had long, cold, white-tipped feathers that extended from its wings and tail making it look like it was wearing a tasseled, shimmering evening gown. Lady Ezra had a trellised wooden Chinese cage and fed this beauty many varieties of fruits. Morris was glad that the Elias and the Gabe families had built a reptile and birdhouse at the zoo. Morris was proud of his Jewish heritage and had an abiding respect for its traditions and values. Though there never were many Jews in Calcutta, Morris had grown up as part of this community that had played a vital role in the city's development. The Calcutta Jews had come to the city from Iraq and Syria when the British first came to trade in India and had grown and had prospered under the Raj. Favoured by the British and commercially successful, many were unsure of their economic futures when India gained independence. Since they were a tightly knit community, once a few Jews chose to leave, other family members soon followed suit. By the 60s, the community had dwindled precipitously. This saddened Morris, who had opted to stay. He had a thriving family business, many friends, and loved his life in Calcutta. He was optimistic about India's future and wanted to be part of the new, emerging India. Morris resolved to be both Jewish and Indian and was quite sure he could fuse the two identities successfully. Though the Selmans were not regular synagogue goers, Morris made sure that his family celebrated the Jewish festivals and high holidays. It proclaimed his Jewishness. He made it a point to walk with his children and Hannah and David all the way to the Neve Shalom synagogue on Yom Kippur Day, the holiest day of all in the Jewish calendar for them to comprehend the significance of the Day of Atonement. Wearing formal clothes, they would set out early in the morning when the weather was not too mucky and the roads less busy. As the synagogue was in the commercial heart of the city, it took them over an hour and a half to get there. To enliven the walk, but not to distract from the sobriety of the festival, Morris pointed out landmarks on the way. When they approached the Gandhi statue at the head of Park Street, he quipped, I should be up there, not poor old Gandhiji in his loincloth. I don't know if this sober, bespectacled guy approves of the nightlife, drinking and cabaret shows for which this jamming street of ours is known.
By the time they had crossed the vast Maidan and made it to Writer's Building, he knew his kids were tired and needed a break. He made a 15-minute stop to view the imposing colonial structure from which the British ruled India that stretched for an entire block. To distract Rachel and Jacob from how tired they were, he asked if they could guess or count the number of statues on the ornate red and ochre brick building. As Rachel craned her neck to look at the statues on top of the building, Morris said to her, You know, it's pretty darn hard for all those guys to stand there all day long without moving, not able to look this way or that. I bet you couldn't stand completely still even for a few minutes. You know what? he said, as if he was letting them in on a big secret, pointing to the church tower of Scots Kirk. They don't stand like that all night long. When the church bells toll at midnight, they free themselves and fly all about Dalhousie Square. It's magnificent to see them whiz by. I've seen some of those very grumpy-looking old geezers enjoying a dip in the tank. Then they put on their stiff British upper lip and nobody knows about all the fun and games they were up to. I'm going to bring you here one night so you can see them for yourselves. When they got to the Neve Shalom, Rachel sat with him for a while on the family bench. She wanted to know why they could not be part of the Mag and David synagogue that stood alongside. Dad, it's so much grander than ours, and it has a steeple too. I like it so much better than this, which is kind of dumpy looking. Morris explained to Rachel indulgently. My family has been part of this congregation ever since the synagogue was built. So come hell or high water, we are not moving anywhere. You know there is a long story of why the two are so close to one another, but I'll give you the short version for now. They bought adjacent land to build one big synagogue. When it was all ready, some wanted to call the new synagogue the Mag and David. Us, Neve Shalomers, would not agree to the new name. So we rebuilt ours and they have theirs. But you can go visit next door and at the Bethel later on. Now I think it is best you join the ladies upstairs. Every Friday, Morris invited friends to celebrate the Sabbath at his home. The cousins next door invariably joined them, so there was always a full table, and other friends were also made more than welcome. The evenings began with Sarah saying the brakot and lighting the candles. A tray of skullcaps, each crocheted by Moselle, Sarah's devout mother, was passed around as the family and their guests gathered around the dining table to recite the prayers and welcome the Sabbath bride. After two short psalms, Morris's dear friend Solomon blessed the wine and passed the heavy silver wine goblet to Morris before it went from the eldest to the youngest to share the blessing of the wine. Solomon blessed the chalas, breaking the soft plated bread and dipping each piece in salt and then passed it around. The prayers over, Morris invited everyone to take a seat around the large oval table. Everyone looked forward to the traditional meal. Morris commented on each preparation, urged everyone to eat more. He often stopped to place an aloo or a piece of chicken in someone else's plate. Ah, I see you need some more aloos. Your plate is empty. Or Morris would say, I see you are not helping yourself. Don't be shy. Otherwise, I will have to fill your plate. At the end of the meal, Morris summoned the cook, Karmali, to the table and congratulated him on his fine cooking. Shabash! You're the best of cooks. Nobody can make aloo makalas better than you. Sarah always prepared a special dessert that was the crowning glory of the meal. She went out of her way to make mango mousse or warm dark chocolate cake accompanied with dollops of vanilla ice cream. After relishing the dessert, old and young retired from the dining table to the living room. Sarah needed no urging to play the piano and played the latest Hollywood movie songs. Everyone sang and clapped along. Between songs, they listened to one another's jokes, riddles and stories. Morris always had the best story to tell. If he had told a story before, the new flourishes, twists and turns he devised made it a newly minted story all over again. Morris, surrounded by his family and circle of friends, felt his cup was overflowing. He bowed his head in profound gratitude to the King of Kings, the Holy One, the Blessed One. Who could foretell that a few years down the line, Sarah would come to dread Friday nights with Morris?